beautiful choir. Before we get started this morning, I want us to get ourselves where we need to be. I need your attention. And I, I need your undivided attention. There, there was a story in Acts uh, chapter 3 um, where Peter and John were, were walking to the temple. And, and, and on their way there, they encountered uh, a man that was uh, crippled, crippled from birth. And um, he called out to them. And, and he wanted some money. He needed some help. And let me read the scripture here. In Acts 3, it says, Peter looked straight at him as did John. And Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. Peter and John wanted this man's undivided attention because he had something special to share with them, okay? There was something that, he, that they knew that they had that would be beneficial to this man that was in need. And, 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 the, and the truth being, it wasn't that he would be able to walk again. So you, you, you're sitting here this morning. I don't want you thinking about where you're going to eat after we get finished, Okay? I don't want you making a grocery list because I know some of you have to make one. I, I don't want you thinking about the gift that you haven't bought yet and, and you're just trying to figure out. I want your undivided attention because I have something to give you, a gift, a gift. Jerry's class this morning in Sunday school, we were talking about giving and what that should look like and how often it should take place. I know we think about these things often at this time of year. Look, if, if you came here this morning with no expectations, you're going to leave with nothing. Okay? If you came here and you weren't expecting to get a thing, you're going to leave the same way you came. But if you walked into this place this morning, expecting to receive something, expecting to have an encounter with the God Almighty. If you came with an expectation of something happening, it will. And I wonder what type of expectation we have each Sunday we come, each Wednesday we come, each time that we come and listen to the choir sing, each time we come and hear the teaching of the Word. What type of expectation do we have? What anticipation do we have? Is it like Christmas is so oftentimes with us now? It's just something that we got to get through. Will you pray with me? God. Father God, I come here this morning purposely seeking you, purposely having an expectation to encounter you, purposely coming here expecting to leave this place not as I came. I pray this for all of my friends that are here this morning. Let us receive the gift that you have to offer to I pray this in our Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I want to share with you this morning uh, a story of a gift, how it came, how it was packaged, how it was wrapped. 
You know, Luke, he was a doctor. I've talked about this before. He was a doctor. You know, he had a desire to, to bring about an orderly account of all of these things. He had asked a lot of people a lot of questions. He had interviewed a lot of people to find out the facts. He wanted to get it correct. He wanted to get the details. He wanted to understand it. He wanted to understand so that he could share it in such a way that you and I would understand it today. So he tells of this historical event, this real event, this thing that happened about 2,000 years ago, a real thing in time and history that took place. Something seeming so insignificant that happens every day, babies are born. Such a big deal. He gives this account. I, I've got, I have my grandmother's Bible with me this morning. Um, and I think Timmy has this scripture probably in the NIV, but I'm going to read it in the King James because it's a whole lot prettier. You know, I, as I get older, I, I realize how much I miss my grandmother and how much I loved her and how much she taught me. Now, my grandma didn't teach me like a professor teaches somebody, Robin. My grandmother teaches or taught me like a... Uh, a skilled laborer would teach. And I, you know, an apprentice, watching how somebody lived their life. And, and knowing the things that she knew, I, could, I, I began to really understand what it, what it says in James 2, or 1, 2, and 4. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. I learned that from Grandma. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I, I pray she can somehow hear us this morning. I'm going to ask if you'll stand. I want to read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Forgive me for these glasses. These are Kim's, and these are not the big print that I'm used to. And that's still kind of rough. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. Then all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the bab babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord... Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And, and all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. And when eight days were accomplished, for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, 
which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Let's pray again. Father, we hear your word. We rejoice in the hearing of your word. We pray our minds be open to receive the hearing of your word. I pray in the Savior's name, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. The problem today with many American Christians is that the wonder of Christmas has been lost. The amazement of Mary receiving the good news that she was going to have a baby, the difficult decision that Joseph had to make as far as how to father this child, the journey that they had to undertake to this town of Bethlehem, the, the, the arriving there and not being able to find a place for her to, to lay her head, to, to give birth to this baby. The fright that the shepherds had. And seeing an army of angels, let's not misunderstand this word of multitude, of heavenly host, the host means an army, thousands upon thousands of angels stood praising God. This story is lost within all the other stories that are out there about Christmas today. It's just one, it's just one of the many aspects of what Christmas is. I'm not going to go into the history of how we came to celebrate Christmas on December the 25th and you know, and if I did, you would find that there were many pagan activities that were around this particular date. And, and, and you would see right away that this is confusing. This is confusing why this day was chosen and, and, and all the other things that were going on around it. And you begin to ask, why do we even pick the celebration of Jesus as the main reason that we celebrate? And we say, why should they when there's a Santa Claus and when there's a Rudolph and when there's a Frosty the Snowman and, and the Grinch? You know, our children know the songs that celebrate these characters better than they know the, the words to Away in a Manger or Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You know, I bet a lot of us know the song How Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. But do we know the words of O Holy Night? Have you ever read the words of O Holy Night? I, I wrote them down. I, I, I just, let me read them to you. I don't want to sing it. I just, just listen to just a chorus, a verse and a chorus. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angels' voices. Oh, night divine. Oh, night when Christ was born. Oh, night divine. Oh, night. Oh, night divine. Beautiful words. Beautiful words. I know we love to sit and watch the Hallmark Channel and the, the Lifetime movies about Christmas. and Just as beautiful as they are and as heartwarming as they are, so many of them never mention the real meaning of what Christmas is. A deception for them that we should all be careful of. That's especially when we're around people that don't know the true meaning of, Christ, of Christmas. We'd rather sit with our kids and watch the Polar Express and, or read them some, than read them some amazing story of an event that took place 2,000 years ago in a little town or village called Bethlehem. I, I, I don't get me wrong. I, I, I think sometimes when I'm preaching, I think, well, man, he's just a, a regular old Grinch. No, I'm not. I, I love Santa and I, I love Frosty. I, I love all those things. I think they're wonderful. It's a time to bring the family together. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for your moms and dads and grandparents to sit down with your kids and say, isn't that a cool story? But let me tell you what the real meaning of Christmas is and grab this book and read to them and teach to them what really took place. We 
need to explain these through our children, friends. We need to make sure that they know that what the world teaches is not the true meaning of Christmas. Because this is what the world is teaching about. It's just a holiday. It's not just another holiday. It's about a gift. It's about a gift. It's about a gift that was sent to us from our Father in heaven, wrapped in flesh and blood. A redeemer, a counselor, a prince of peace, Emmanuel, God with us. And that's what it's about. But because of these other distractions, there's no anticipation for Christmas. There's anticipation for the gifts. There's anticipation for the meals. There's no anticipation for the babe born. Real expectations is not a lot of gifts under the tree or hidden somewhere. Or Christmas certainly isn't racking up your credit cards and spending half the year to pay it off. Jesus Christ was born, the incarnate Son of God, the creator of all things, became flesh that we might know him, that we might experience the love of God, that we might have the gift of salvation. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, I'm going to read some scripture today to you because it just is enough. It just is enough. I want you to listen to these words. I want you to expect to receive something when I read these words to you. I'll read them slow. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. What a proclamation, friends. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh. Amen. And made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That is the story of Christmas, friends. That is the story we teach our young ones. That's what we let our little ones know occurred on this day that we celebrate. The government stopped our schools from having nativities in them. You, you know, I had a friend uh, some time ago that uh, their choir, their church choir, was asked to sing at the Sheridan in New Bern. And when they got there, they got there, the, the, the manager of the hotel asked them not to sing any religious songs. No religious songs at Christmas. Well, I thank God that they sang more than they had planned to sing. I thank God that there are people that will not be pushed around and told that they can't speak the name of Jesus at Christmas. I, 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 thank God that, I thank God that we can teach our children not to be ashamed to let their friends know what Christmas really means. That they can tell their friends at school that, that Christmas is not about presents, but, but Christmas is about the mercy and grace shown by the Father in heaven that he would send his son as a gift to each of us. There's people that were expecting him also that didn't recognize him when he came. In, in Isaiah chapter 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, 
For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And, and, you, and, you're, and you're sitting here this morning, and you're probably asking, you know, what's Steve trying to tell us? You know, he, he said to have some heart of expectation, receive something from God this morning. <coughs> <coughs> I want you to know the gift that was given to us is grace. Just grace. It's all about the grace. <coughs> Paul described it in the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So that though through his poverty, that you through his poverty might become rich. <coughs> I had the flu last week and I'm feeling much better, but I had a little tickle in my throat that um, seems to bother me. The story of Christmas is not just a story of how you and I might attain the grace of God by seeking after him. Friends, I want you to understand this. You're not seeking after him. He has sought after us. Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 21, it says, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He made in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. See, see, we've got this problem with this, this here, and that's sin. We've got a problem with it. You know, we, we essentially are constantly putting ourselves where God deserves to be because we, we, want, to, we want to have a authority and, and, and majesty and, and chart our own course. And grace is the story of God coming and putting himself where we deserve to be. Huh. In a place for the recipients of punishment that we deserve for our lust and for our jealousies and for our selfishness. Paul of Tarsus understood it when he said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified freely by his grace. Now, friends, you know this. God, God has come to us in the person of Jesus to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. We can't accomplish this. Why did he come? He came for this. We, we see the religious people of the time, and even today we say, if I'm good, if I, if I do this, if I do that, if I act this way, if I say this, if I read this, if I, if I give this, you know, God will love me. And John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I just tell you, friend, God loves you. At Christmas, we like to buy a lot of gifts, and we, we spend a lot of time shopping and wrapping stuff, you know. You know, and at our homes, you know, we put them under the tree or we hide them, you know. And uh, I, I remember when Kim and I were first married, and, uh, you know, we didn't have much to give each other at the time. But, you know, I would wrap something, put it under the tree, and, and she'd always unwrap it while I was gone and look at it and wrap it back. And I think she thought she was pretty slick about it. But see, I'm a terrible present wrapper. And when I come back, the, the corners were all neat and the bow was pretty. And I know the elves didn't do it. And she'd always act surprised what she got. So, you know, if you, if you buy a gift, you, you, you like to receive something in return. If you give someone something, you like to receive. It's fun to receive. I know it's... Better to give than to receive. I, we talked about it this morning, but it's nice to get a present, too. You know, Gary, it is nice to get one. It's nice to get a gift. You know, uh, 
there's a gift that's available to each of us this morning. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm, I'm going to conclude this. And uh, in, in remarkable time, I had, I had told myself that I wanted to have this message be brief because I wanted us to focus on the Jewish of Masada this morning. I just want us to consider this, that we consider the story of Christmas and let us realize just what it really means. I mean, a grandma may have gotten run over by a reindeer, friends, but, uh, but that's not what Christmas is about. The story of Christmas, listen to me, the story of Christmas is about the cross. <laughs> and we, we, we think it's the nativity, it's the manger, it's the shepherds, it's the magi. The story of Christmas is about the cross, and that's because that is why it came. He came for the purpose to die on the cross, to do something that you and I could not do for ourselves. He paid the price. Death has been defeated. And love is worn out. When the wise men came before the child to bring their gifts, you know, they most likely had thought of themselves as being very important people until they saw the face of God. When they came into the presence of Jesus Christ, they knelt before him to share with them what they had. You know, I so often hear a lot of people ask me all the different reasons why Jesus came. And there are a lot of different reasons we could use and say. How many of you remember Paul Harvey? He told this story. I think it's a very good explanation of, of why Christ came. You may have heard it. He was telling a story of a man. It was a good man, and, and, and uh, it was Christmas Eve, and his wife was going to go to the Christmas Eve midnight service at church, and she had asked her husband to come, and, and he said, you know, I understand why you do this, but I just don't believe in this whole thing about Jesus. I don't believe that, 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 that God sent his son so that we could, we could understand who God was and how much he loved us. I, I, just, can't, I just can't buy all of that. He said, but I'll wait up for you. I'll wait up for you until you come back. So as she left, and as he sat there reading his paper that night, it, it began to snow. And he got up, and he looked out the window, and the, and the flurries were coming. It was getting larger and larger, and he went back and settled down again for a while, and he heard a thumping outside of his house, a thumping. And he got up, and he went and looked, and he saw out the door there was some birds there that, that had been caught in the storm. They couldn't get away, and they were flying into the window pane thinking there was a place of safety. He didn't want to see the birds die. So he goes outside and he, and, he, and, he, and he thinks, he said, I'll get them into the barn. We've got a barn there. They can stay there. They'll be dry and they'll be warm. And so he goes and opens the door. He, he, he lights the, the lantern inside and, and he tries to shoo them in, but they wouldn't go. And so I think he thinks, I'll get some food and I'll make a trail. So he gets, he gets some bread and crumbs and he, he runs it to the barn and, and they wouldn't have nothing to do with it. So he runs behind them. He tries to catch them. He tries to shoo them in, but they just scattered everywhere. And he was so brokenhearted, knowing these birds were going to die. And he thought about it. And he said, if I could only be a bird, if I could just be a bird, I could talk to them. I could live with them. They, they know that I'm not trying to harm them, that I, that I just want to help them. I can just save them if I become one of them. And it was at that moment that he heard the bells of the church where his wife was attending ring. And he fell to his knees and he prayed and accepted the Lord. I, I pray, friends, that we understand what took place. What really took place those many years ago. I pray that it is alive today in your life as vibrant today as it was those many years before. Jesus Christ has come to save the world, to save you and to save me. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that we receive this gift, this gift of salvation, this gift of grace, this gift of love. And as we receive it, I pray, O oh Lord, as we acknowledge it, that, that we are givers of grace, that we are givers of mercy, that we are givers of love. 
that we can share you in this time, most especially this week. Even though we find ourselves guilty of not doing it as often as we should, I pray, Father, that there will be an overflowing abundance from us this particular week. I know there's going to be so many hectic things that have to take place in the next few days, but let us just be still. Let us feel your presence, God. Let us share you with someone else this day. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.